Palette to Palette with Robert St. John and Wyatt Waters is made possible by a generous contribution from Sanderson Farms. Additional funding is provided by this and other public television stations and from viewers like you. Thank you. We arrive at the Walter Anderson Museum and pull up and there's Tony DeFata. DeFata, DeFata, anyway, there's Tony. And we know Tony. Tony's from Jackson and from Hasburg, and he's a good friend of ours. And Tony comes out and greets us and gives us a tour of the place. And everything's going really well. And then suddenly we see John Anderson, who is just looks remarkably like his father. I mean, he looks like, it was, it was very spooky to be at the Walter Anderson Museum and see someone who is his flesh and blood walk up like that. You know, the Walter Anderson Museum, I know I speak for you when I say that place is one of our favorite places in yes. all of Mississippi. Walter Anderson, uh, present company excluded, ah. one of our favorite artists He's, yes, one of in my all favorites. of Mississippi history. It was a significant emotional experience in my life, and it was very meaningful and one of, one of the highlights of the trip for me. The Magical Mississippi Tour was a complete and total immersion in the Mississippi food, art, culture, personalities, and here we are at the Walter Anderson Museum. We did Walter Anderson season one. We're into season four now, thanks for joining us. But this experience, not only because John Anderson was there, but because we had 40 people yeah. along with us who are depending on us to show them these things that we love all across Mississippi. And one of our greatest loves is, uh, is that Walter Anderson Museum. Oh, heck yeah. That experience, and, and you and I have done a lot of events at Walter Anderson over the years during the Peter Anderson Festival out on the porch, uh, in the community room, but there was something different about this night and there were several reasons it was different. Uh, Tony DeFata's son uh, was playing accordion as we walked in. That was really cool. Yeah. We're at the Walter Anderson Museum. Let's go through and see what they got here. There was a, it was a bar and everybody was having fun, but they rolled out the red carpet for our group. It couldn't have been nicer. And Tony DeFata, who you and I have known for a long time, really took care of us that night and he also designed your very first album cover. He did do that, he yeah. did do that. I'm a musician too, and I got a chance to hear his son. That was a really great thing, but they changed the museum shows out every three months. It's a great museum down there, and it's, of course, the permanent collection is the Walter Anderson uh, the work. And that's a, a great thing for people who don't know him, or people who do know him, want to know him in a deeper way. Well, uh, one of the last times, it's been a few years ago, I guess we were there, uh, I was in there and I, I was just wandering around. We were getting ready to do something, and there were a few people there that worked at the museum, and I said, I put on my best uh, Mississippi voice, I said, I see that bicycle up in there in the corner right there, and I said, uh, I'll give you $50 for it. And I think they really, you know, I was just messing with them. They thought you were serious. Well, I, yeah, I kind of I kind of introduced this thing as a joke, and it kind of went back and forth. I finally said, I, I'm just kidding, you know, I'm playing. Mm. Yeah, I did notice the bike is uh, still there. As is the little boat. Times when we had been there before, mm -hmm. the boat was really on the floor. I remember that, yeah. Right there, and, and now it's it's hung up high uh, to probably keep people like us from making jokes like you would with the bike <laughs> and, the, and the other things. So. But I have great reverence for Walter oh, Anderson's absolutely. work. I must say I was just messing around because it was just one of those moments. decided instead of being in the schoolroom, in the classroom, that he wanted to go out and draw nature, so he would go to the zoo. I have a great reverence for Walter Anderson. I mean, um, a, a lot, my work is done from life. The reason I progressively do that more and more is because you're in front of life and you get a chance to directly experience things and that's really, I can't think of a better example of an artist doing that than Walter Anderson. He endured all kind of hardships to have that direct experience. 
artists kind of tread this weird thing between am I making a, something a consumable and am I expressing myself and it's really hard when you're looking to make money off your work but you still want to remain sincere to yourself. Walter kind of figured that out. He believed that artists should give, give to people, to create things of beauty that people could enjoy. And it wasn't just about what he was seeing, it was about how he was seeing what he was seeing, and patterns, more than just the subject. He's a great, great painter, and it was a huge honor to be there and, and, and do the stuff that we did. Yeah, he did it to the extreme. Mm -hmm. yeah. He had a show in Brooklyn, and um, he wasn't living with his family at the time, but he had an aunt that passed away, and so he inherited some money. He shipped all of his block prints up to New York, and when his family came to pick him up from the cottage, there was a little note on the door that said, gone to China. And they were like, you're, we're gonna take you to New York, New York, you're gonna become a rich, famous artist, but he inherited this little bit of money and decided, I'm gonna go experience the world and other cultures. His, his, his goal was to walk and bike and hike and hitchhike or whatever it took to get across China to go to Tibet to see the temple art. Um, unfortunately, he uh, was robbed of his money and his passport and had to make his way back across China and then have money wired to him to, um, to be able to come back to America. I, I see a lot of parallels between Walter Anderson and Y. Waters. What, what Walter Anderson meant to that town is a, is a true kind of character, so to say. You're not a character, but I think you mean a lot. Uh, your gallery is there in Clinton, Mississippi, and you were the artist in that community that's uh, most prominent and uh, are leaving, uh, leaving your mark and uh, legacy uh, on Mississippi art. And I, I think there's a whole lot of similarities between Walter Anderson and Wyatt Waters. He said something uh, interesting about an artist's uh, relationship to the world. He said there's the art, I'm paraphrasing this, but there's the art that you do for the world, the public, and then there's the art you do for yourself. And sometimes you use the art that you do for the public to, uh, to feed the art that you do for yourself. So he understood the relationship between the out there, the inside here. And, and another similarity is how prolific Walter Anderson and Wyatt Waters both were and are. And uh, when Anderson died, they found thousands of watercolors on typing paper in that small room. And I know your gallery is filled with thousands of watercolors you've done over the years. You have a work ethic unlike any artist I've ever known. I and I sometimes think it was a play ethic, though, to be real honest with you. It's just something you can't help but do. It's, it's not something you choose to do or want to do. Maybe you choose it at first, you make, you, but once you get yourself going, the art pulls you in, and you can feel that in his work. You can feel that he was involved in this. It wasn't a job. It wasn't something he was overly making himself do. It was something he was drawn to do. You know, and a prime example of that, art for the public and art for yourself, is the little room. Yeah. That was attached to the house he lived in on the Shearwater compound uh, that no one had ever been in. Yeah, I'm gonna let this guy finish the story if you want. This is, this is John Anderson. This is Walter's uh, youngest uh, son. He knows a little bit more about all this stuff than I do and everything's going really well. And then suddenly we see John Anderson, who is just looks remarkably like his father. Yeah. I mean, he looks like 
It was, it was very spooky to be at the Walter Annis Museum and see someone who is his flesh and blood walk up like that. Well, the, the story that I heard was just from my mother. She was pretty broken up. She was spending all of her time just uh, in the, the barn where we grew up, uh, looking out of the window. And after about a week, her older sister, Pat, came down and said, come on, sissy, it's time to, time to get up and we need to go down there and clean up Bob's house. So they went down to the house and there was one room that had a lock on it. And that, Daddy never used a lock for anything, but there was a lock on one of the uh, rooms in the little cottage. They couldn't find the key, so my Aunt Pat, being very resourceful, she, she found a hammer, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so they went into the little room. The first thing that, that Pat saw was a rooster crowing over one window. So she, she named the little room Creation at Sunrise. Actually, it was a whole day of, of, of light rather than just the sunrise. You know, he just heard we were there and decided to show up. We were we were truly honored. John Anderson came, he showed up, he talked about his memories of his father, yeah. um, what the art meant to him, but also uh, what his father thought about the coast and working in that town. It made it very, very personal. What, what did you feel when you walked in here? I was amazed that we didn't know it was here, you know, that, that he had done this. Um, so much of what he did, we were unaware of. He was working, but we didn't discover until after his death how much he was working. My mother, I remember hearing, overhearing her tell a friend of the family that her husband would have been a wonderful artist if he hadn't decided to be a beachcomber instead. <laughs> that, was, that was before he died. And after he died, a few years after he died, I heard her tell somebody that the reason Walter Anderson was such a wonderful artist was because he had never forgotten to be a beachcomber as well. <laughs> uh, a beachcomber walks the beach and looks for treasures. Well, Daddy was always looking for treasures and he never, never missed one. He never walked by one. <laughs> so he was always kind of beachcombing for treasure. One of the highlights of my life, and I'm not saying this lightly, is to be in that little room that came from Shearwater Pottery that was locked for so many years that nobody went into, and to be in there when John Anderson described the first time he went in there after his father had passed away and the experience his mother had in that room. It was a significant emotional experience in my life, and it was very meaningful and one of, one of the highlights of the trip for me. There was a trunk full of paintings, and um, on top of all the paintings, he had uh, placed a handwritten copy of the 104th Psalm, which is a, a song of thanks. So to me, I think of the Little Room as kind of his song of thanks to, to Providence. It's also a blessing to just to live the life you want to live and to be who you want to be, fitting in is overrated. Yeah. Uh... There were two things that I thought about Daddy. One, he was incredibly brave. He was one of the bravest people I ever met. And going against convention requires being brave too. And the other was that he was 
the least compromised person that I had ever mm. met. Daddy woke up every morning and basically he did the best thing he could possibly do with that day. For me, this is uh, this is a uh, this is a uh, this is uh, I got a little emotional a minute ago. I'm trying not to get emotional now. We really appreciate you taking time and, and spend with us and and share share those memories and everything. We hope you'll join us for dinner. Can we can we feed you? Yeah, if you want to watch. Well, I know. <laughs> We are so lucky that the museum exists not only to house his work, but it saved things like the little room that would have been lost in Katrina. Yeah, Katrina wiped out Shearwater Pottery. I mean, it just did. And that room would have been gone had they not moved it and attached it to the museum, which is a really cool thing to have done mm -hmm. because it takes you into that experience, into his world and how he lived and how he saw the coast. And, and without the museum, uh, not only preserving his work, but preserving that room, we wouldn't have that experience today. Yeah, that whole beachcomber thing that he talked about was, was moving and, and accurate. And uh, he was a true, if you think about it, I don't know what other areas in the country have an artist who's so connected with an area and suffered for his art yeah. like Walter Anderson did and dealt with extremes to the point to where he strapped himself to a tree during storms out on Horn Island. You know, that is so unique to the Mississippi experience and to the Mississippi Gulf Coast. And to see the mural in that little room, but also in the community center. Yeah, the community center is, I think he did that for a dollar, is that right? Was that I think so, yeah. Was the price that he had on that? It was, a, a, it was a gift to the community. There was the personal art, and there's the thing you do for your public. Mm -hmm. You live in the world, you know. And again, and I hate to do this, but the parallels between Wyatt Waters and Walter Anderson <laughs> is you did the mural in Clinton in your hometown right across the street. It's one of my, I love it. <laughs> and uh, that's there, but yeah, that you, don't, you don't like to make this comparison. <laughs> but folks, I'm gonna tell you, there's a huge comparison between Walter Anderson and Wild Waters. I believe it's true and it is true. There was a, there was a guy when I was doing the mural, he pulled up and he was saying, you know, the city's got a, got a lot of drainage problems and road things and I can't believe they're spending money on you doing this mural. And of course, I was you tell doing, them how much you were I'm charging for nothing, you know. And nothing. And I, so I said, I just messed him. I said, you know, they liked it so much, they doubled my pay on this. <laughs> well, at least Walter got a dollar for his mural. You got nothing. But I love the mural. It's awesome. And, and you and I have done several events in that community room yeah. over the years uh, to help the museum raise money and to bring awareness to, to Walter Anderson's work. And at one time we were able to cook in there. I've talked to people who went to high school dances there and they taped posters and things to the walls. Wow. Yeah. Now, oh my um, gosh. as it should be, uh, they are very uh, cognizant of uh, preserving all of that work. What we're gonna do here, typically this is a dual demo. And that's why you're not eating crab meat, Eunice. <laughs> you're eating crab meat, Holloman. We were doing a dual demo. We were gonna feed our uh, guests and have a big concert in the community room. And uh, when we do a dual demo, you do an art demo, I do a cooking yep. demo. And so we really could do only 50% of that. You did the art demo. I couldn't really do any cooking in there. And that's fine because I respect exactly how they want to preserve that space. And so, I, you know, I did a little bit of storytelling. John Anderson joined us in there. So it was cool. really cool. And uh, you did a great painting, a good still life. And so there are no cooking facilities in there either. And we had to feed about 50 people. And so Tony DeFata, um, who works at the museum, just basically let us use his his home kitchen, and we cooked the meal for 50 people in that kitchen, brought it over to the museum. The museum people had, uh, uh, a lot of the museum staff helped us serve that meal, and it was a meaningful experience. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was under kind of a battlefield conditions a little bit, but we made it work, and everybody enjoyed it. We'd had a great seafood meal, and uh, you did a great painting. Who couldn't be inspired to paint in that room where he painted the murals? I mean. The museum staff got me so got me some of the widgets that uh, he had made. Their widgets are the figurines that he made and sold to make a living uh, during his lifetime. So I was able to include those in a still life. 
It was a lot of fun. It was, it was, it was the right subject in the right place. It had to be cool to be doing a still life surrounded oh, by, yeah, that, by yeah. that mural. Yeah. Kind of feed off that energy. Yeah, definitely. I think my favorite definition of art is anything done in an excellent way. It's not, it has very little to do with the fact that you've got a brush in your hand. So every day on the Magical Mississippi Tour started with Bloody Marys and Mimosas. We had all of this Mississippi food and art and culture all through the middle of the day and every day ended with live music. And our final night uh, on the Magical Mississippi Tour, we had Blackwater Brass and these guys were funky. Probably the, the best known fun party band on the coast, Blackwater Brass. <laughs> Man, and they brought out the funk that night. <laughs> it was good. When you think about music in a museum, you think about something a little more formal, perhaps classical, but this was funky music. Not a string quartet in tuxedos <laughs> at all. It was Blackwater Brass, and they jammed. The thing that that night meant to me, because you and I have done dual demos, probably 150 or more yeah. of those over the last 20 years, but the thing that meant a lot to me is that we had these 40 people with us that we had brought along with us. We had been in all sorts of museums, and, and they had watched you paint all over Mississippi. But to be in there with really two iconic artists, one surrounded by Walter Anderson, and they were watching you paint a still life, was a, was a very meaningful experience, I think, not only for me, but for the entire group. Well, you do the same thing with food, though. It's all about bringing people together and sharing things, and you're sharing more than food. You're sharing each other. And that's, that's the cool thing about art, too. I think, I think art and food have that commonality. Mm -hmm. They bring people together. They can bring people together. Yeah, I think they do. And that's what these trips are about, really. It's a relational thing. Mm -hmm. the, the people relating to you and me, the people relating to the places we go to, to the art, to the music. We never thought we would make such good friendships. Go
They were great. And who would have thought touring Mississippi, a place we know so well, could be this much fun. And we've had fun doing it too. And there's more to come. paintings seen on today's program are featured in the A Mississippi Palette Cookbook. This beautiful volume also includes Mississippi Heritage Recipes, A Mississippi Palette Cookbook. Palette to Palette with Robert St. John and Wyatt Waters is made possible by a generous contribution from Sanderson Farms. Additional funding is provided by this and other public television stations. And from viewers like you. Thank you.